Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Mothership Audio Podcast. Today, it's me, Alex, with my co-host, Efe. Hey, guys. And we have a very special guest today, who is our old professor and musician FIPA and general great audio wizard, Philip Vlatkovic. Hi, and welcome, and thank you for the invitation. Great. So I think that we should kind of start from the very beginning and kind of ask, like, how did you get into the whole audio madness? Well, uh, first of all, uh, I consider myself very lucky to grown up in the in the family where my dad used to be an engineer, recording engineer. So I kind of started hanging around, with, you know, studios probably at, at age three or four. So I was always kind of there. I didn't have any clue, you know, what was going on, obviously, except you know, there were some guys and there was some, you know, drums and loud guitars and everything. But um, Fortunately, I was lucky enough to kind of start from the beginning, even though I've never really considered myself, you know, growing. I did not have this kind of, you know, epiphany, I'm going to do this. Yes. I mean, I, I did at one point, but it was much, much later. The story usually goes that, you know, the, the band comes in and they record stuff and they're not happy with the engineer or producer and then they have to fix it. So I was the kind of guy who was the most proactive about being the fixer guy. And that's how it all came to be. All right. So what, what would you say, like, what was your first project that you felt like, okay, I'm a producer now, I'm an engineer, and this is like, I, I am in control of all of this. Yeah, that was exactly what I was referring to. That was my, uh, I think it was a second demo for my band that we recorded. And because it was my dad's friend's studio and he never wanted, he didn't want it, you know, to charge us for the session. So he just said, okay, I'm going to give you the session. I'm going to record you for free, but it's going to be direct to two track. So whatever you, you know, do and whatever you say in between and, you know, there's no post-production, there's no mixing. We're going to set up the sound. I'm going to press play and I'm going to go for lunch and you guys just record. <laughs> All right. So it was uh, so, so but we were not really ready for the recording. So uh, after that was done, it was a very mediocre product. I was kind of, you know, tasked with trying to edit stuff to make it sound as, you know, normal as it should be. So I was editing constantly, you know, the whole mixed final track and that I considered that to kind of be my first editing job or my first production job in, in terms of being involved into a project from the other side of the glass, from the kind of a production side. So um, that was kind of it. And then afterwards, it, you know, we did another session and every time we did another session, we were more and more ready and i was taking a much bigger role in terms of what i was doing so at the end you know we were started to record ourselves and uh, me getting a small porta studio was was one of the highlights of that era you're basically gonna focus on the point that your parents were the ones that kind of inspired you to get into there because you come from this household of uh, audio enthusiasts well my dad was kind of like you know he he grew up in the the very kind of old school way of doing thing and, and that was kind of you know that was the late 90s mid uh, starting of the 2000s and things are really tricky back then because nobody knew how this digital audio technology was going to develop and the old analog ways were you know dying out and so, so he was like you know this is a kind of a dying job you don't really have to go there and, and stuff like that so he was not really happy about my decision but uh, afterwards you know nowadays he's really like i'm teaching him to to mix in daw and everything and he's like really really up for it basically yeah they were encouraging me they were letting me do my own thing so most of the times in these early stages i was just like doing you know trial and error and I was mixing it by myself. I didn't want, you know, any any kind of help. That was the beginning of internet. So we were trying, I was, you know, Google, well, Yahooing at the time, uh, you know, techniques and trying some, you know, downloading PDFs and reading some, you know, dad's books and stuff like that. I knew that there was something there and uh, nobody to stand in my way. I was able to make it. Oh, beautiful. It sounds like a story where the apprentice becomes the master in general. <laughs> <laughs> it's an amazing story. In your journey through this, this road, let's say, what kind of albums, what artists inspired you to follow this profession in general? Well, being in a house where, where there was a lot of music, obviously, they played a lot of good music and obviously some, something they, they most most played most of the time was, was the Beatles. And uh, when I heard called the Twist and Shout as a kid, I knew that I wanted to play something. Then they enrolled me into, you know, classical piano and I took classical piano lessons and everything. But, you know, as I got older, I realized that I cannot really rock out with piano. At that point, I didn't know that there was something like, you know, Daryl Lewis or Little Richard or something like that. So I was like, 
maybe I could, you know, go to, you know, and play drums. And, you know, my parents were like, no way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not, you know. So then I said, you know, I, I think I have a guitar. It's, you know, at grandma's house. I, can I, you know, do guitar? And he's like, no way. No, no, no. no. So I, I, I uh, misled them that I'm going to, you know, continue doing piano. But I went there. I took the guitar. I, I s- downloaded some lessons on how to start playing guitar. And of course, he tells the story of him coming back from work and then just hearing somebody play a guitar. And he was like, but I didn't that did not teach him what's going on here. And, you know, and I was, was strumming along, and, you know, I was uh, the chord. Uh, there was a site with, with the chords and all these songs and I was downloading, printing them and learning them every time, you know, hidden away from everybody. And uh, basically with, with these kind of things, he knew that, you know, this cannot be stopped and I have to, you know, uh, progress. So well, you had the upper advantage when uh, at that time you tend to l- learn about two instruments instead of one. You have piano up your sleeve and the guitar. Yeah, but I mean, I was not great at either of, of these instruments. But you know, in, in terms of understanding, you know there's, there's a lot of times I hear some uh, older colleagues actually tell me that why are drummers usually good? you know, engineers and mixing engineers, uh, because they actually have a lot of acoustics going on there and their instrument is mostly based on acoustics, right? So all the time while playing these instruments, they listen to, you know, you know, the reflections and the positioning and how to hit something very, uh, you know, while on the other hand, you know, if you're a pianist, you don't really think about acoustics. You just think about, you know, voicings. You think about, you know, you don't really think about the color because the color is, mm-hmm. the color mm-hmm. of the instrument is set. And there's nothing to be adjusted within the piano anyway. Yeah, there's nothing to be adjusted. You just, you just play it and that's, that's how it goes. So it must have been an interesting experience for you when you first got your hands on analog synthesizers since you have so much piano knowledge and you felt like, oh, this is very kind of basic. I can't really modulate a lot. Yeah, well, uh, th- that came a little bit later. I still am a very fond uh, fan of 1980s music. So I, I kind of looked around, you know, learned a lot about these synthesizers. And I had the luck to be studying with uh, with a colleague of mine who's really a kind of a synth guru in Novi Sad, Vladimir Moritz. And he, you know, he just, uh, we just clicked and, and we talked about a lot of different synthesizers. I got to, you know, try a lot of different uh, synths uh, at his, you know, home and his studio. And then I kind of went and I remember one one very uh, interesting, it's not really a synth related story, but I remember when I was first visiting New York, New York City, uh, I was like 14, 15 years old. And I remember that there was the, I, I think it's, it's 48th Street where the, all the music stores were there. And there was a line in front of a, uh, Sam Ash electronic store so they 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 would sell electronic instruments obviously synthesizers there was a individual you know uh, guitar store there was individual drum store individual brass store and stuff like that and there was the I- electronic instrument store and there was a line in front of it for for people to kind of get into and look at something so one day I, w- I was passing through and I was like oh my god what are they waiting for and the next day I was I was running around and then after a couple of days these kind of lines are, were, were cleared out and I went in and I saw that they were actually standing in line to go I- and look at uh, Roland MC-303, the groove box, which was just released several days before. So they had, the, you know, the world premiere of MC groove box. And it was uh, a huge thing for techno artists, for hip hop producers, for uh, it became really, really popular. So everybody wanted one, but there was, you know, limited resources. And I was just like, Oh my God, these people are just wanting, you know, a a piece of gear. And after maybe 15 years, I got to buy one for, you know, 100 euros and I still have it somewhere, you know, stashed up. It's really a a nice uh, synth of sorts. They can really perform, you know, atoid sounds. You can perform, you know, arpeggios. You can perform. It's really difficult to program, but it really has a soul of its own. And you can actually perform just on that one module you know everything that's amazing i mean i I always like those kind of like stories when people just first kind of see something that they've never even kind of imagined before and i don't know synthesizer being so modulated became such a big thing especially since we're a fan of the 80s music ourselves I i think that everyone has their own synth story and this was a really nice one as well it was a revolution of sorts i mean because never have i before seen you know a line of people waiting to you know 
to see something, you know, because they they were it was so anticipated in in the ad sections and every and in the, in the you know in magazines everybody was trying to figure out what what is this next big thing going on go, going to be, and it turned out to be this uh, group box. So. Um, as I've said, I still have it somewhere, you know, and uh, I occasionally take it uh, take it out and turn it on to just play with it, and it just sounds amazing. So basically, here we are now going into the more, the, the meat of the whole subject, and we're going to ask you basically, you know, what was that moment where you felt that, okay, I'm doing this full time? Oh, it's, it's um, I mean, it re- it's really hard to tell because as I've already said, I was, I was in the studios from age three, <laughs> but uh, it's probably when I did my first like, you know, 16 hour long session, I think we were doing some location recording with my Porta studio and I, ha- I was recording a band in their rehearsal room. So we woke up, we, you know, had breakfast, we went there, started with, you know, with the drums and we were just recording one song and it took the whole day you know we had you know just a lunch break and then we ended up in three four o'clock in the morning and i was like okay so so this is it right so this is the job right and uh, when 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 that came in well you know the first thing that comes to mind when when talking about you know full time and, and talking about why and why what why what engineering means to me is is because you know even if i had this kind of a full-time job uh, or, or you know, a 16-hour session or 8 or 10-hour session, it's never going to be uh, exactly the same. And, ne- and every day is totally, every session is totally different and every session is totally unique and specific. So it really uh, gives a, a kind of a sense of, you know, uniqueness to, to, the, to the job. You know, I, I mean, I could never work, a, a, you know, a desk job 9 to 5. So this is how I avoid repetitiveness. I guess we are all just uh, a big boors against that white collar 9 to 5 office job kind of lifestyle when it comes to yeah. this. I mean, especially since uh, you, me and you, Efe, we kind of come from that background. We've been doing that white collar stuff. And basically we were just like, you know what? I want to be at home mixing and producing and not exactly. be at the desk look at the screen all the time for no reason yeah i agree but yeah i mean we all kind of developed this interest and i think this is such a passionate feel that we're in that it just kind of feels like it's right in a way and you kind of have to be obsessed with these things and i mean since you have so much experience you know working for television working for movies working on movies and and also making records you have this very philosophical approach to it like wh- what would you say would you prefer working on and how how are things different for you how do you approach them it's a different dynamics it's also different from you know music to movies or tv or radio than to you know doing live as well and doing you know audio for games it's all you know it's all the same tools but the dynamic of work is is a little bit different my start was in music and then i you know moved on into um into doing uh, a little bit of movies as well and then for the last five six years i was doing a lot of like broadcast production and uh, you know radio production so uh, to me it's it's very interesting you know to switch fields but as well but at the end you know i always kind of bring back and go back to music because that's my original calling let's say and uh, uh, you know different approaches really take on different let's say mindsets and to me you know a live engineer is never going to work in studio and mindset of a a studio producer working in in live it's also is also never going to work so you know and some some people have you know a hard time switching this kind of mindsets uh, but if you're, you know, if you're versatile enough, you can kind of very, very much switch off this mindset and go, OK, so now I'm doing live. I have to, you know, not use the rules that I, I, I was using in studio and I have to be more quick. You know, in, in live, it's, it's very important to be very quick and very agile in studios. You know, it's important to be you know, creative in TV. It's, it's important to be, um, you know, to, to create dynamics and to create with creativity, of course, to, you know, present, uh, if you're working on a documentary, for example, to, to present the, n- the most natural sound you can get. So I'm never going to put on, on my documentary, uh, you know, 1176 that's going to color the sound completely. 
and stuff like that. You know, this is just an example. Oh, yeah. All right. So what are some interesting stories that you have working in studios with and with a large number of artists, let's say? Is there a particular title you are most proud of or have the fondest memories of anything that you want to share with us? Or any kind of special studio stories, because everybody loves hearing about those. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I've, I haven't really thought about these um, but I was I was very fortunate enough to mix a song that was uh, performed by Simon Phillips, and that was my one of my highlights to kind of have this. Even though I did not really mix the, the the whole thing because you know once I put the faders up, it was just sounding amazing. So <laughs> in a way, but there's a lot of working with Joe Lambert, the, the mastering engineer with whom I mastered my solo album, is also a, a, a huge uh, highlight in my career because he's a uh, He's a really great guy, and he mixed some. Uh, he mastered some of the uh, some of the records that I really uh, love, and uh, we get to hang hang out and to to work together. So, so I mean, the next question I, I know the answer, your answer to this question, but we should ask: analog or digital? Ah, uh, the the age old question. <laughs> um, if you were asking me you know, like privately, I would say yes, analog. But <laughs> <laughs> publicly, uh, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, I, I always I always say, you know, I really like analog because it puts me into a certain kind of a mood and it also kind of, you know, pushes my creativity in a, in a different way. But I could never, you know, work in you know, like fully, fully analog as it was done, you know, 40, 50 years ago. So I really like, you know, the, the, the possibilities of digital and the uh, flexibility and, uh, you know, recall and everything else. But I really like the analog sound. So my quest has been always kind of uh, trying to get as much analog into digital as possible so uh, i would say both but uh, if you really if you really want me to choose i will always say analog all right well since we're already here and since you're already kind of telling us a bit of your preferences uh, when it comes to mixing what would you say is that lifesaver that kind of thing that a lot of engineers should know that kind of ignore or more of something that you've kind of figured out for yourself that you just use on most recordings when i start uh is uh you know first of all just push the faders up and just close my eyes and listen to the song and then visualize something we are, are, are already talked about with uh, with david gibson's like visualization art of mixing song uh, book and uh well basically when i when i do that kind of thing it already you know becomes clear what i need to do also during uh, earlier stage if I'm you know recording and I, if I'm already involved in the project you know previously or uh, preparing or pre-production I'm always going to write you know notes and, and you know a lot of stuff and a lot of us creative guys I mean you know uh, how it goes they just like to go with the flow and then just work with whatever and I'm all constantly like even though I'm you know in this kind of creative mood I always you know write notes and ideas what I could do in the mixing stage or what it would be a good idea in mixing stage and some of them sometimes it, they don't work but because mixing comes you know a couple of months later we forget about these uh, ideas and then I just look at my notes and say, oh there would be a good idea to you know put you know a delay on these you know drum loops or whatever and they was like oh cool and we would try out and it wouldn't work and it was like, okay, well, it was a dumb idea anyway. <laughs> yeah. So besides the things that you have a um, habit of doing, you usually tend to also use um, try and fail, try and fail until you find the, the spiciest and the sweetest adjustment. Yeah, I mean, what, 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 what experience does, and if you, if you, you know, watch a lot of these, uh, you know, tutorial videos and a lot of, you know, people will say, uh, I use, you know, this kind of compressor or this kind of reverb for this. It's only because they have, you know, experience and they have failed so many times to, to use this uh, piece of device and it gave them the results sometimes that they wanted and they just kind of, to avoid going around, they just pick it in terms of, uh, of doing a, a certain job so they don't really lose time because, yeah. you know... As Precisely. <laughs> As you Precisely. get, you know, as you get more, you know, proficient, you want to spend more time with with doing. And, you know, I've got to a point where, I, and you know, uh, the mixes that I was using, that I was, you know, when I 
open up a project that I did like, a, you know, 10 years ago. I just set it up and I in, in five and in 10 minutes, I'm done with the mix because I know what I want to do. You know, I mean, these these songs have been already mixed and, and done and released, but I did a couple of remixes for my old projects. And when I opened it up, I was just like, oh, I see. I had to, I just had to do this. And it was like instant, you know epiphany i was like okay i i really now know this stuff <laughs> <laughs> right yeah amazing and uh, speaking of which when it comes to uh let's let's quote back on our question analog or digital or your approaches to the mixing and mastering phases of your work is there any particular gear or plugins that you consider that okay i need to use this in my arsenal or this is a lifesaver okay so let me just i'm gonna state my uh, analog choices and i'm gonna state my plugin choices so all right also what really depends on the project what i do uh, in terms of uh, whether it's a uh, you know analog fully and if the song needs you know it has been recorded you know in digitally and if we, if it would benefit from being uh, uh, you know a, an out of the box mix uh, then it w- would it benefit to have you know a uh, digital you know outboard reverbs and outboard compressions and stuff like that outboard eq would it benefit you know that w- that's my first question when i start mixing because you know even if, if if i all have this analog a lot of these analog gears in, you know in my home studio I sometimes tend not to use it because the song really does. And that's where you need to, you know, you know, draw a line and say, OK, so I really need to, you know, use uh, some of my best works and my really nicest, you know, recordings that I've, that I've done are, you know, fully in the box because they did not need this treatment. And uh, when I'm doing analog, I you usually have my distressors patched in. So these are the compressors I cannot live without every time. They're mostly on on a bass guitar and vocals. I really they're this very versatile types of compressor. They can work you know very lightly or they can work you know extremely extremely extreme with all these distortions and you know uh, nukes or so what what they, they they have this kind of button that's called nuke, which kind of simulates the all buttons in in eleven seventy six. And I also never. Uh, do mix an analog b- uh, without my small uh, Lexicon LXP1, which is the small 1980s uh, kind of a cheap version of a Lexicon reverb outboard. Re- it's a half rack device, a really small half rack device, which you can you can buy really cheaply. But this has this amazing dense sound. It's kind of an, a little bit of noisy, but in a, in a full mix, it will usually this noise would be covered up. And and the 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 character of this reverb is so amazing beautiful beautiful information for all the listeners and for us as well (laughs) absolutely they also did like lxp5 which is kind of multi-effect and then they have lxp15 which is a full rack device with both of these algorithms but the key thing with with you know choosing uh lexicons try try choosing you know prior uh 95 or something like that because they had totally different chips that had a totally different sound very dense and uh you know uh very big sound uh lush dense big sound that it's really the characteristic of of that uh company and when we get to uh, uh plugins i always uh end up my uh digital mixes with uh well 1176 obviously in any of the iteration whether whether it's you know you know waves uad or uh, any other you know copy or you know bomb factory even i also use a lot of nls waves nls which is a the, the nonlinear summer that was released a couple of years ago that uh, kind of emulates this nonlinear distortion by analog consoles and uh, i also use a very kind of uh, you guys maybe already know this but the, this is a defunct plugin called rn digital detailer uh, and it runs only on like Windows XP or something like that. So I have a specific machine. If I want to use it, I, I run a sp- run it to a specific machine. Uh, and it's this kind of a harmonic exciter that really adds a totally three-dimensional uh, perspective to the songs. And I r- usually use it in uh, kind of a remastering techniques or, uh, you know, in-the-box mastering stuff for uh, some projects when th- which I need to bring to life or all the stuff that has been lost all the transit that have been lost during recording and during mi- you know mixing and the whole process are kind of bringing bringing back brought back by this plugin it's uh, it's amazing i highly suggest you uh, you find the Ro- uh, roger nichols book 
I, I don't know the, 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 the title of the book, but he, he tells the story about how it came to be and he actually built a hardware one. Uh, Roger Nichols was, was uh, the late uh, engineer for uh, Steely Dan uh, and a lot of other, obviously, great acts. But he built one analog device and then in the early 2000s he developed a digital one. I think that because you are basically considered a pioneer of Americana genre and American folk music in the Balkan region, and that's a very interesting choice to kind of record an album with that, especially here. And uh, what, what would you say, what artist inspired you to do this? What, what was that like? Was it like you took a telecast and you're like, yes, okay, this is it? <laughs> well, I, I did not really start in, in, in Americana. Um, in a way, it was, it was 2005 or six, let's say. And I was uh, actually all once again became uh, came uh, started from from the studio, and I was recording this band that did uh, something like uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers. We became you know good friends, so I did a lot of projects for them. And at some point, uh, the bassist gave me uh, the um, I think it was John Frusciante's first solo record called or second solo third solo record called. Uh, shadows collide with people yes absolutely fantastic album and i was like blown away with this music because it was experimental and it was still kind of you know a little bit of here a little bit of there and then i started exploring obviously his other concepts and other more acoustical types of music and um, that of course led me to you know opening a whole nother genre of 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 you know music that was not that was not you know mainstream rock and roll or mainstream pop and uh, I started, you know, listening to a lot of, you know, uh, you know, Neil Young and uh, even newer stuff, you know, starting from City and Color, which is kind of this kind of uh, emo turned Americana type of music. And uh, and I during all of that time, I kind of wanted to develop my own. I was I stopped playing in bands and I wanted to find my own sound. And this is was kind of something that was really um th- this really kind of brought me into into the picture and i was wanting to use that kind of a sound in my own interpretation so uh that started uh influencing me more and more and more and i started you know writing some songs uh, while i was not recording some other projects and then the song would pile up and then i would throw them away <laughs> and i would write a new batch of songs and i would throw them away and suddenly it, it was kind of distilled into these three or four songs that I really like really well. It all distilled into these three uh, songs that I put on MySpace, and it was it was it was MySpace era, and I had a lot of people just tell me, "Oh my God, this is really unique!" And a lot of my uh, musician friend they would listen to it and they would say, "Oh, this is I've never heard anything like this before," and you know they all. Uh, kind of uh, some of them would describe it as Americana some of them would describe it as kind of a singer songwriter type of music and then I I just got okay so I need to do something out of this and I stopped you know uh, recording at some point I got too busy and uh, it shelved the project and after a a couple of years I opened up my uh, back I was backing up files and I'm backing up a lot of these different projects and folders and files and everything and I stumbled upon this and I said, okay, so this is, this sounds really good. I should really continue with this. And that's how the story began. All right. So that's basically the beginning of Hard Songs for the Brave, your debut album. Speaking about that album, because uh, from what we've read that you've recorded in Novi Sad and then you went to New York and recorded there as well with a lot of, with a lot of kind of famous session musicians. And that must have been such an amazing, memorable experience to actually, I think a lot of people have dreams to kind of like go and record in New York City, which is like this cultural hub for music and recording. So do you have any special stories about that? Oh, well, once again, too, too many to tell. I took a year off and I went to live abroad, obviously. I was studying at the time, I was finishing my studies. So I went to work and to, uh, you know, apprentice at one of the studios. And uh, on the off time, I went to see a lot of shows. I went to see a lot of open mics. I played a lot of open mics. And uh, I got to record uh, in, in this uh, beautiful Brooklyn studio. It's called Seaside Lounge Studios. And uh, I just had a wonderful time with uh, the guys there. And, and, and the owner is a drummer of a lot of, a lot of good you know, New York uh, indie bands. And we just it was just all around, uh, you know, a good experience and not, not just by, you know, having a session all day and then just, you know, bashing it out and then 
at the end on the uh, in the end of the night you go back to the city and you you, you know listen to uh, a great gig and then you're constantly like inspired and constantly uh, have all these um things going inside your head you know and it was just um it was just a memorable all around memorable experience to be in the you know it's in the kind of epicenter of of the world of happening and um yeah it was just it was just amazing and one more question for for the whole process of recording the album is it true that you recorded everything on tape solely on tape yeah i think uh six or seven tracks uh out of 11 were recorded you know purely on tape uh 24 track tape and we uh only after we finished uh, recording the whole songs we dumped them into pro tools so I then maybe added a little bit of, you know, a track here and there. Seven or eight out of 11 were recorded fully, you know, on, on tape. And uh, basically all of them have been uh, then put back into into analog and mixed out of the box in a, in a fully analog way uh, with uh, outboard and no amp simulations or, um, you know, if, if, if it was a Hammond, I, I used a real Hammond organ. Oh, if it nice. was, you know, uh, 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 I didn't have a, any, actually, I didn't have any synths on the, on the record, <laughs> which, is, which is really contradictory. Uh, but I plan to, to uh, introduce synths on, on the next project. Yeah. I, I think actually now that we're talking about that, uh, the whole Americana genre, Sturgill Simpson is one of the pioneers also these days. And he just released, well, not just released two years ago, an album that had a lot of synths in it. It kind of drew inspiration mm -hmm. from the 80s and 70s kind of vibes. And he also kind of used, I think, I'm not quite sure which synths. I know he used the Prophet and so on. So maybe that could also be one of the ways you could go forward with your music. Yeah, I'm, I'm still thinking about whether I go... You know, even more, uh, uh, even more acoustic, or just just turn turn you know another way and go fully electric, <laughs> fully electronic. So I mean, since one of my in in inspirations, John Frusciante did you know everything. Uh, it's it's up to me that I also do uh, every every aspect of it. This is an amazing story for for the album and how you created it entirely without synths and everything, but. It before you decided to do that, were there any inspirations that led you to this way or in general for the album? Were there any uh, specific artists that inspired you writing the songs and recording them? Yeah, I mean, most definitely. I mentioned before, you know, obviously with uh, John Frusciante, but I was listening to a lot of City in Color uh, at that point. Uh, I still really love, you know, you know major artists from major artists uh, such as, you know, Weezer and Foo Fighters and, uh, um, you know, you know, Beach Boys and stuff like that. That was that was my main inspiration. But obviously underneath that, there was a whole layer of uh, gazillions of, of, you know, small artists and independent artists. I really like Ingrid Michaelson was one of the artists that I really liked at that point. And this this was all like very indie uh, singer songwriter type of music and that type of music was not really present in this and this is why uh, some somebody somebody uh, called me a pioneer in the and the balkans and then kind of stuck uh, but uh, later obviously uh, since i never really took my americana career to another level uh, it came to this uh, point that uh, at you know like five six years ago it was really huge insurgence of of these artists in belgrade and uh, you know, artists such as, you know, Stray Dog and Anna Churchin yeah, yeah. and uh, Wooden Ambulance and all of them, they, they, they kind of pushed this whole thing uh, much more than I did, you know, ever. Uh, but um, I'm, I'm lucky to kind of be considered one of the guys who started it, even though it was, you know, fully underground and I did not really have a, 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 a official release until, uh, you know, a year ago. For the next question, I, I actually, this is Alex's question, so I would love him to move forward with that but during your answer i will have a few questions as well just a personal taste about spirit Peronian. oh yeah um well basically we know that you're the founder of spirit peronian which is a spirit club so we did want to ask you does a good american bourbon help you with americana oh definitely <laughs> <laughs> beautiful i i remember running into you in the whiskey festival in belgrade Back in 2018, I think. Yeah, well, that's that's this is something that we uh, uh, you have to have a you know a, a side interest, and you know uh, mm. if you're not listening, to, if you're not listening to music, you're creating music. If you're not you know creating music, you're listening to music. So you have to kind of make a break of it from that. Exactly. And uh, 
uh, we had this uh, crew of, of uh, my close friends and we were just like doing uh, these intimate tastings of, of different types of uh, spirits and whiskeys and rakias and, uh, you know, gins and stuff like that. And I said, you know, why don't we make it official and we just create a, you know, spirit club and uh, we did it. And, you know, a lot of people joined in and we obviously not now in, in 2000 and in, in, in tw uh, 2020, we had um, just like a, a three or one or th one, one, two or th I think three gatherings. But effectively, um, we used to gather, you know, yeah, each month and then do this kind of um, tastings and then talk about, you know, different stuff. And then obviously, you know, play some music. If, if we we're, you know, tasting, you know, whiskey, we play some, you know, country, we play Americana. If we we're tasting, you know, uh, tequilas, we we're doing, you know, Mexican music. Uh, so it was, it was really, really uh, a, a, f a fun activity. And uh, definitely, I mean, I had, I had the opportunity to, to uh, tour a little bit of the American South and, um, Though, although I was a, a really a young, a young age, but uh, I did not enjoy spirits at that time. Uh, but I really kind of have the idea of how they how they perceive you know whiskey as it is there kind of a cultural cultural thing and it's a really her heritage thing, you know. And if you think you can find you know you know so many uh, songs about you know whiskey, whiskey and, and you know <laughs> I mean I, I I read somewhere that I think Kings of Leon recorded Sex on Fire while they were drunk on you know, in 2 a.m. where they were drunk on whiskey and, you know, you have uh, uh, the very old cover from uh, Chris Stapleton, Tennessee Whiskey, that actually got him a, a Grammy, I think, a couple of years ago. And uh, that's, that's just uh, the way it is. Amazing inspiration from an amazing drink, to be honest. <laughs> I, I want to ask you just a personal question. Any specific favorite single malts? Well, I would say when we talk about scotch, uh, I, I, I am a big uh, fan of, of Macallan. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it's a kind of a very major thing to do, but I do have, um, also a couple of uh, minor favorites. Uh, one of them being Kalila, if it's, if it's spelled correctly, K O K O, uh, L K A O L I L A. And, um, it's a little bit PT, but you know, perfectly balanced. So I, I don't I don't really, really like the peaty ones. I am more for a, a kind of a you know a velvety um, smooth uh, taste. Ah, oh, perfect. I, I Go team. <laughs> <laughs> we would like to ask you basically, since you are considered an industry veteran, like you you've seen how the years have treated the audio industry. Like, what yeah. what have you seen? What have you noticed? And do you have any grievances? Any hopes? And is the loudness war finally over? Oof, it's a tough question. <laughs> um, well, I, I'm, yeah, I'm in, in a way, I've kind of, I was lucky enough to, you know, start when uh, things were, you know, it was kind of considered the end of analog and nobody knew what was going to be happening. And during my studies, these kind of four years, I've, I've witnessed, uh, uh, witnessed a dr drastical change. And, you know, when I started studying, it was, uh, it was like, okay, so... We have these uh, digital platforms. We have DAWs. They are re don't really sound good, but you know this one sounds a little bit better. But it it's not really quite there. And you know during uh, and and after I finished my studies, like all the major recording studios in the world have been closed, um, you know demolished. You know it, everybody was already using you know Pro Tools was it was an in industry standard, and it was a kind of very very drastic change in just a couple of years so now that we have i mean uh, you know the kind of a digital digital revolution is 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 basically done we all use uh i mean computers for audio production we all look at you know screens what i'm witnessing is and uh, especially with you guys at sae uh what i'm witnessing is that you know people uh, and, and, and kids starting out nowadays they are starting in a completely digital environment you know, the, uh, you know, if you look at, you know, something like, a, you know, Slate, Raven, touchscreen mixing device and not really, uh, you know, not really a tactile device in a way. So I'm kind of fearing of, of these audio generations uh, growing up with a almost no tactile, you know, uh, connection or perception of sound. Mm -hmm. It's going to be fully, you know, fully visual. And that's what kind of 
uh, freaks me out the most. But I mean, uh, you know, the audio engineering group will find a way. Everybody will, you know, people will find a way to kind of use it. But what kind of I'm witnessing now is, uh, you know, these generations that don't really have a connection with uh, the the physical world, and that's the problem. That's not uh, in in audio engineering. You know, that's in in everything that in every technology kind of now is moving toward this kind of a cloud-based thing and mm -hmm. whether it's a good or bad thing which is we have to see you know I'm, I'm, i don't know i mean that's fair enough i mean we are me and f are still young enough because i think when we started it was already predominantly digitalized so we just yeah and of course we're we're still trying to get away from that kind of saying you have to mix with your ears and not with your eyes and uh, the computer screen is kind of tempting us what i sometimes do is when i'm mixing you know in, in in on the board on analog i just i create a um, shortcuts or i use a, a controller with with transport and i just turn off my my screen for a while you know obviously sometimes you know maybe some plugins are active and here and there but uh, i they tend to do that a lot i just want to you know just keep the strain off my ears and use my uh, keep the strain of, of my eyes and just use the ears and just works perfectly so uh, I mean, concerning loudness wars, yes, I've been uh, I've been there. I've been there a little bit before. I've been there during the wars, <laughs> during the war. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I think yeah, they're mostly over because you know I'm talking from my experience uh, from from the broadcasting side of my job, and uh, loudness wars are technically over, but there are some still people who are trying to, you know, find their uh, ways around and it's always going to be, you know, a cat and mouse game and everybody's going to want to try to avoid that kind of loudness normalization standards that everybody's imp employing and everything else. Uh, but uh, I think it's going to take a little bit more time for, for everybody to kind of join in, especially that, you know, these digital um, mm, uh, providers and, and digital distributors um, streaming platforms have each, everybody has their own kind of idea what that should be right so there is not a kind of a global uh, set setting that everybody should uh, you know adhere to I mean there is but still it's in a kind of a you know early phase or you know it, it's a very slow process so if if everything goes okay and everything goes right for the next couple of years uh, I think we're gonna have you know the, the loudness wars effectively you know uh, non-existent hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> honestly we yeah. do have to ask you this since as we said you are a veteran what advice would you give to young audio engineers and producers when they're starting out when they're trying to get into the industry what, what do you think will we, we have came to the classics yeah we come to the <laughs> classics yeah what we give young engineers hope to like say okay you can make it don't worry about it just focus on these key things i think that the most important thing nowadays is since we all have you know uh you know we can all use the same equipment everybody can you know down and buy the same you know plugins or use you know uh, it's it's not a matter of what you have but it's mostly the matter how you handle stuff and uh, what I see most with with um, uh, young people and, and, and students and uh, they're not as proactive as they should be and that might be uh, you know you know just uh, you know write emails if you want to you know if you want to mix songs by other people then just you know write emails uh, say you're gonna mix you know a, a free song for them uh, s you know, just hang out at, at uh, you know, gigs and try to, you know, whenever you find a good band, you say, you know, I, I do this. Do you want to, are you recording something at the moment? Can I, you know, uh, help you with that and stuff like that? So kind of being uh, at the right, you know, most of the times uh, all these success stories with people who have been in the industry so long is that they have been on the right place at the right time. And, sh and if they hadn't been in the right place in the right time, somebody else would be. So that's kind of you know a very kind of a, a kind of a rule of a t thumb that if you are uh, proactive, you're sometimes gonna be at the right place at the <laughs> right time, right? Absolutely. So if you're not, you're you're never gonna be <laughs> you're never gonna be anywhere. Uh, so always kind of knock on doors. Now that's much more important than it used to be. You know, you know, in, in the old days you had studios, you would just, you know, go in and um, take an internship in a studio. It's some, you know, somebody would get sick and you would get, get the job. That's once again, 
uh, being at the right place at the right time. But it was not a kind of a proactive thing. It depended on somebody else. Now it's much more that you have to kind of, you know, you know, have a gunshot and go to <laughs> and then you'll hit something. That's one thing. And considering tips, um, when you guys are starting out and um, young engineers are starting up, starting up, uh, this one thing that, that I learned is never try to make uh, a kick drum sound big with EQ. It's just not possible. <laughs> okay, that's really important, <laughs> actually. Yeah, I, uh, believe me, I tried it so many times. It's just not possible. If you need to do it, just add a sample, or you know, go go back and re-record stuff, or just add another microphone. Just trying to make it b- sound big and with EQ very very uh very hard oh i can hear glenn fricker screaming that you added samples <laughs> and before we part ways as we say we would like you to plug yourself you know tell us what you're working on right now where people can find your work and what few fu- what future does your career have what future projects are you looking forward to um ooh. uh well you know this this year has been very interesting in in a way um you know career wise uh, but um, basically, I'm doing a lot of, you know, uh, I'm demoing a new, uh, a new FIPA record. I'm also doing arrangements, and hopefully, I'm going to mix soon uh, the the record for my uh, guitarist in my live band, Igor. He's a really great singer songwriter. You should check him out, Igor Sakac. Um, and you'll probably have to put the link yeah, in we'll the description that. as well. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm doing a little bit of archiving, wh- whether it's uh, uh, you know personal stuff and just going through my obviously because we get so much time in, in at home these days. I run through my uh, you know hard disk and trying to sort out stuff and if need you know backup stuff if needs to be backed up, and just making you know uh, some order out of out of messes and nothing, and uh, you know that's a that's probably about it so far all right well, we're looking forward to hearing more from you and of course the next fifa record as well yeah and yeah you can you can you can listen to hearts are from the brave on my Bandcamp page yeah i forgot the that link will be uh, down so below. it's uh, yeah fifa.bandcap.com and on any major p- streaming platforms as well i don't really have uh, a kind of a website with, with doing with uh, you know my my professional website and my artistic website so i kind of opened up uh, a kind of a mix of, of both uh on on the instagram you can you can uh follow it at uh, uh at uh, hashtag or at how do you call it uh it's this is fipa Right, we'll also add that in the description. And uh, yeah, again, Philip, thank you so much for coming on the show. And thank you for, for having me. I mean, it's, it's really an honor to have you guys. Yeah, thank you guys. And be sure to check out our next episode and see you until then. Have a good Bye-bye. night. Bye. Ciao.